So uh, welcome back to the afternoon session. So um, it's our pleasure to have Taylor J um, from USC and IES, who will speak about unitrangularity and decomposition matrices of unipotent blocks. Yes, thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be in Princeton and it's, uh, I'm very grateful to have been invited to give a talk at this workshop. Uh, yeah, so today my talk is going to be about uh, unitriangularity of, of decomposition matrices. My talk is going to be a little bit of a bait and switch, much like the paper that this is based on. Uh, we, this uh, is joint work with Olivier Brunard and Olivier Dudar, and their names will come up again later, so I won't write them down now. But uh, I guess in the paper, we uh, the paper is about unitriangularity of decomposition matrices, but actually proving that takes up a, a, a very small part of the paper. And most of the paper is involved in proving a totally different statement, which is very relevant. So I'm gonna talk mostly about a totally different statement and I'll come back to decomposition matrices just at the end. Okay, so <clears throat> we're gonna be talking about finite reductive groups. So there's a little bit of setup here, which is kind of fairly standard. So I'm gonna uh, work over with a finite field F and I'm gonna pick an algebraic closure of this finite field. And I'm gonna assume that I've got a G underline that's a connector reductive algebraic group and it should be defined over my finite field. So that means that I have a corresponding Frobenius endomorphism on this group. And if I take uh, fixed points of the uh, points of this group over the algebraic closure under this Frobenius F, I'll get a finite group which is really, I can just think of as the F points of this connector reductive algebraic group. And so this is the finite reductive group that I'm gonna consider uh, the representations of. So I'm gonna be very sloppy and I'm mostly for the rest of this talk, just gonna identify uh, this reductive group with its points over the algebraic closure. Uh, so P for me is gonna be the characteristic of my finite field. And I'm gonna uh, assume that L is a prime that's different from P. And from this point forward, I'm gonna state this now so that I, um, I'm gonna always assume that P is a good prime for G. So this just means that it's uh, not too small. So if you don't really know what this means, then you can just assume that P is bigger than five in, uh, in, and that covers all cases. But this is just a technical assumption that, uh, that we need. But I won't remind you again that I'm assuming this. <laughs> because I'll forget. Okay, so the starting point for this talk is um, a result or some of work of Delina Lustig, which is maybe some of the origins of geometric representation theory. So they defined a, a set of what are called uh, unipotent characters of G. So these are irreducible constituents of uh, characters obtained by taking traces of compactly supported cohomology of a certain variety, which, and these are known as delinistic varieties. So I'm not gonna to worry too much about the definition of, uh, of these things. Most of the talk is gonna mostly be about uh, these characters. The important thing for us is, well, that they really serve as a model for all irreducible characters of our group G. So in some sense, unipotent, most questions about irreducible characters um, can be reduced to questions about unipotent characters of some different group but they serve as a really important uh, starting point for understanding character theory for this group. Okay, so what we're gonna be considering today is the classification of the unipotent characters. So the starting point for this classification so I'm in no way going to attempt to uh, do any justice uh, to the chronology of statements uh, here. I'm gonna flip a lot of things around on their head. And I'm gonna start with this result, which is uh, Judah Lustig, 
and uh, there are uh, contributions by Geck. So this theorem says that if you start with a, unip uh, a unipotent character, you can associate to it a, a unipotent class. So not of this finite group, but it's a unipotent class of this, uh, of this infinite group. And the following properties should hold. You should have the, the character is uh, non-zero for some for some rational element. So this class should have, should actually meet the finite group. So there should be a rational point and the character should be non-zero at one of these rational points. And if you have a unipotent element of your finite group and your character is non-zero, then it should be the case that uh, your element is contained in the Zariski closure. of this class. So in a, in a well-defined sense, this is the largest class at which this uh, character takes a non-zero value at unipotent elements. So this is somewhat uh, surprising. I often find that this is very, uh, uh, very surprising that, that somehow the representation theory of this finite group sees the closure relation amongst unipotent classes so if I was to replace irreducible characters here with IC sheaves on a unipotent class, then maybe this would be much less surprising because this is in some sense baked into, uh, into IC sheaves that they should only be supported on the closure of the, of the set. And so in some sense, this is a shadow of that fact that actually these irreducible characters are kind of closely related enough to uh, uh, IC sheaves that they maintain some of their, uh, some of these geometric properties. Okay, so this gives us a starting point for kind of partitioning the set of, uh, of unipotent characters. But uh, I think it's not quite true, I think, what you said. It's, it's not quite true, yes. I mean, that's, you that is either, true. You can take average value on the unipotent, then it's not zero. It's the largest. No, no, this or, is okay because I'm I'm no, no, working no, no. over unipotent unip unip characters. No, no, or you can say that there is some element for which character is non-zero whose unipotent part is in this in this okay. Then it's true. Ah, okay, okay. I have to replace it. Sorry. Yes, okay, okay, yeah. Sorry. I was trying to simplify things. Yes. No, you're right that I should say that if G is in G, then uh uh and chi of g is non-zero. Yes, yes, you're right. Sorry, thank you. Yes, I should replace it. Like, I should say it like this. Okay. Okay. So this gives us a partition of the unipotent characters into subsets, and they're going to be indexed by uh, unipotent classes. of G underline. So some of these sets may be zero because uh, they're, uh, because I mean, the class may not meet, may not contain a rational point or for other reasons, they may be non, uh, may be empty. So actually the unipotent classes that are involved here are called, uh, are called special. So these are the ones for which these sets are actually, actually non-empty. I should kind of mention that these are actually Lustig's families. Which are related to the two sided cells of the vowel group. Okay, so maybe I'll say just one thing now that's um, uh, that's interesting about this uh, partition. So this set of um, of unipotent classes the 
these are partially ordered, by the closure relation. So in turn, this gives us uh, some kind of uh, partial order on the set of unipotent characters as well. So let's just look at a, a quick example. So if G is GL and F, then the unipotent G bar classes are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the partitions of N, just given by looking at sizes of the blocks in the Jordan normal form of, uh, of, this, of this element. And so in this case, The, there's only one uh, unipotent character which has unipot has uh, this class as its unipotent support, O lambda. <clears throat> now the closure relation here is just related by the dominance order. So we have O lambda lies below O mu, that's uh, if and only if lambda is dominated by mu. So this property about, uh, about the unipotent support is telling us that if we, if we look now at the values of these unipotent characters at the unipotent elements, and we pick some uh, total order refining the dominance order. So let's let's say the lexicographic order on partitions. Then we should see that the values have uh, a triangular shape on this uh, on this uh, at, at these elements. So here we use the fact that. O lambda to the f. This is a this is a single G class. So there's no splitting between conjugacy classes when I go from uh, GLN over the algebraic closure to GLN over this finite field. Okay, so let's just look at uh, a few more examples. So what about if we take, say, the trivial class? OK, so what should uh, have unipotent support the, the trivial class? Well, that means that you should be 0 everywhere except uh, at every unipotent element except the identity. And there's uh, one special character with this property. It's the, it's the Steinberg character. And there's another extreme example which you can take, which is the, the regular class. So this is the unique maximal element in the poset of, uh, of, of, uh, of unipotent classes. And the unipot the, you, there's a unique character with this as its unipotent support, and that's the trivial character. OK, so we always have these two extreme examples. Let's just maybe look at one more interesting case. Let's just uh, look at the case where G is SP4. So in this case, the we can still think about, um, we can still use partitions to parameterize um, unipotent classes in terms of the Jordan normal form again. So the G classes, there's going to be four of them. There's going to be the trivial class, one with uh, two blocks of size two. Oh, I think I want two. Uh, should be uh, 
Yeah, it should be this way around, I think. Yeah. And then the regular. So this class is, is not special. So there are no, um, there are no unipotent characters with this class as its unipotent support. We already know what goes on with these two. And so this can, this class corresponds to the remaining unipotent characters. So these are three principal series characters. And a character denoted by theta 10 and by uh, Srinivasan, which is a, this is a cuspidal unipotent character. Okay, so these, this idea gives us a way to roughly partition the uh, sets of uh, the set of unipotent characters. And so now we're left with a, a problem. We want to parameterize the elements of the set. of these sets. Now, it will not surprise you to know that this problem has already been solved by Lustig. So this is solved. Uh, this is due to Lustig in around um, the mid eighties. So let's fix uh, an element in uh, a rational element in our conjugacy class. And for convenience, I'm going to assume that the Frobenius F acts trivially on the component group of the centralizer. Of this element. <clears throat> now, in this case, we have a one to one correspondence between the unipotent characters. in this set. And what's known as the Drimfeld double. So this is the Drimfeld double. So this consists of pairs So this takes pairs, which are elements of uh, elements of uh, this group A bar, and irreducible characters for the centralizer of that element in A bar. And actually, these should be taken up to a natural uh, conjugation action by by the group A bar. Now I wrote A bar here and not A G of U, and that's because uh, actually it's not quite AG, this component group that goes here, but a quotient of it, which is called uh, Lustig's canonical quotient. So here, uh, A bar. Is Lustig's canonical quotient. Okay, so just an example in this case where G is SP4 and U is in this 
uh, class which contains uh, four Unipot characters, then this component group is just uh, a cyclic group of order two. And it's actually isomorphic to, in this case, it is isomorphic to Lustig's canonical quotient. So in this case, because I have an abelian group, the Drimfeld double just consists of um, is has uh, the is the order of a bar squared. So here the Drimfeld double has four elements, and it's, these correspond to the four uh, to the four things we saw before the four characters we saw before. <clears throat> now the purpose of the rest of my talk is, in some sense, to try and understand. Uh, or to recast in a different way this parameterization or give a different meaning to this parameterization of Lustig's using the Drimfeld double. So for this, we need to use a construction which goes back to, uh, goes back to Kawanaka. And these are called uh, generalized Gelfand grave characters. <clears throat> so for this construction, one starts with a pair, which is a symplectic F vector space. Now this is the same starting point that uh, Zhi Wei took in his uh, in the first talk of the of the workshop. And when you have such a pair, you can uh, you can form the the Heisenberg group associated to this pair. So as a set, we just identify this with uh, V cross F. And then the multiplication is given by, is given like this. So what's really happening here is that when you take the commutator of two elements, you uh, you get the value of the uh, of the symplectic form. So I'm, I'm going to allow an extreme case. Uh, so if if v is the zero space, then uh, I'm just going to assume that the Heisenberg group is uh, is just the additive group of the field. Okay, so what I want to do is try and construct uh, representations or characters for my finite group using uh, using the Heisenberg group. So this is uh, this is what Kawanaka did originally. So we're going to do uh, so we're going to do the following. So we're going to start with uh, a unipotent element in this finite group. And what we can associate to that unipotent element is a co-character of, of this algebraic group. And this is uh, defined over the finite field. Well, if you have a co-character, co then you can also associate a corresponding parabolic subgroup. And this will also be defined over F because the co-character is defined over F. So as an example, if, uh, if U is, I'm sure many people should know this example, if you take a regular, a regular unipotent element in, uh, in a Borel subgroup, then your corresponding co-character should be half the sum of the positive co-roots and the corresponding parabolic should be should be the Borel. <clears throat> so typically when we're doing when we're working with reductive groups we want to look at levy factors of of um, of parabolics because they're again reductive but here i want to actually look at the more terrifying part which is to look at the unipotent radical of the parabolic 
So we want to try and go in this other direction to try and produce uh, representations. <clears throat> so I'm going to look at the fixed points of the unipotent radical of this uh, of this parabolic. And what Karanaka observed, I believe uh, Lustig also observed this in um, in some cases as well, is that um, we have a quotient from this unipotent radical onto uh, a Heisenberg group. where this symplectic form is, is determined, determined by U. This is ever so slightly a lie in that I don't, might not subject entirely, uh, but I might wanna kind of replace, I might wanna kill out part of the center of the Heisenberg group, but this is pretty much what, what we want. <clears throat> so, if you have this subjection, then we can get representations by pulling back uh, representations for this for this Heisenberg group. So this is what Karanaka, Karanaka did. So he formed these generalized Gelfand grave characters. Associated to the unipotent element. So you can just induce from u lambda the inflation from the Heisenberg group of something, and this can this can really be some or any irreducible character of the Heisenberg group. <clears throat> so this actually doesn't matter which one you which one you take because when we induce to G, they all become identified and we get the same thing. So this uh, maybe not not, not one dimensional, no? one dimensional allowed. Would you mean one character? Is it? You mean not not many characters? One dimensional representation. I mean, there should be a unique irreducible character lying over each character of the of the center. And I just want to take. No, you mean not necessarily of dimension one? That's what I said. Not of dimension one. I mean. Oh, I don't want it to be of dimension one. Yes, sorry. Yes, exactly. So I want I want it not to be of dimension one. Thanks. Yes. Not of dimension one. When uh, V's non-zero. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so this this construction is such that um, uh, we get that gamma u is equal to gamma v if the unipotent elements are a, con a g conjugate. So this is these uh, these GGCs are very closely related to the to the conjugacy classes uh, uh, in our in our group. So why is this relevant for us? Well, this is due to a there's a, a result which is due to um, to Kawanaka uh, in '86 and uh, and in some special cases and Lustig in general in '92. So it says the following, if you, if you take a unipotent character and a unipotent element in a unipotent class, then if you're 
character occurs in one of these generalized Gelfand grave characters. Then it must be the case that not quite that the unipotent support lies over O in the partial order, but you have to replace this with what's known as the Spaltenstein dual class. So there's a, a kind of duality between uh, looking at uh, multiplicities of this irreducible character in these generalized Gelfand grave characters and studying their values at unipotent elements. <clears throat> So Kawanaka had this idea or this proposal that you should be able to distinguish unipotent characters by looking at their multiplicities inside these uh, generalized Gelfand grave characters. But the problem is there aren't enough of them. So in say the general linear group, in the case of the general linear group, there are enough generalized Gelfand grave characters there are exactly the same number as there are uh, as there are unipotent characters. But for instance, already in this case of SP4, so uh, in the case of uh, SP4, then the class this class is uh, uh, a union of two uh, G conjugacy classes, but we already know there are four characters. So we, we have to produce more, uh, more characters to kind of separate out, uh, to separate out the unipotent characters. And so Kawanaka had an idea for how to do this <clears throat> so let's let's continue as above. So we'll we'll assume we have a unipotent element and a, a corresponding co-character over F. Now Jiwei already noted that um, when we have the Heisenberg group, we have an action of the So we can consider the semi-direct product of the of the symplectic group with the with the Heisenberg group. <clears throat> now, if you have a p prime subgroup a P prime group that centralizes both lambda and the element U. So if I'm centralizing lambda means that I'm in the Levy factor of my parabolic and centralizing U just means that I centralize the unipotent element. So if this is a P prime group, well, the unipotent radical is a P group. And so I can look at the, the product, which is going to be semi-direct. And I'm going to get a map into the semi-direct product of, uh, of the Heisenberg group with this symplectic group. Now, what Jiwei mentioned in his talk was actually we have what's known as the Ve extension. So the irreducible characters of the Heisenberg group that we're considering will extend to the symplectic group. So that means that uh, because of this map, we can also uh, extend uh, and pull back to, to the group, the, this unipotent group that we're considering inside the parabolic. <clears throat> well, 
if you want to have one extension, other extensions on this semi-direct product are easy to describe. You should just tensor with the, with the characters of this group A, because it's a, it's a quotient. So for any irreducible character A, you can get a character gamma is I such that gamma u this just decomposes as a direct sum of these of these gamma u's i's and it decomposes as the regular representation of a does and these are what we call Kawanaka characters Okay, so these are going to be some ends of these uh, generalized Gelfand Grave uh, characters, which are obtained using this, this VEI extension. So one would hope, so we know that the, we know that the unipotent characters should be, uh, should be occurring inside these generalized Gelfand Gelfand grave characters. And Kawanaka's suggestion was actually that uh, one should be able to separate them out uh, using uh, these Kawanaka characters. So that means really that uh, these Kawanaka characters should just contain a single unipotent character. Okay, and this is, this is actually the main result that we were able to prove. So uh, this is, so this is uh, joint work with Olivier Brunard, Olivier Duda, which appeared in, in 2000, which appeared this year. So it says the following, so, so I'm going to assume the algebraic group is, is adjoint which for the purposes of unipotent characters is not such a big deal because they're insensitive to the center. And let's assume O is a special unipotent class. Then there are a family of Kawanaka characters Gamma Uzi, such that if you project Gamma Uzi. So if I just look at the parts occurring on this, uh, just the constituents coming from this set of, of unipotent characters, then this should, this has, oh, I should say the spot in the sand jewel. This has at most one constituent And this occurs with multiplicity one when it occurs. So this is particularly relevant. So for these um, for these Kawanaka characters. So of course, in geometric representation theory, we have very um, powerful tools available to us coming from perverse sheaves and Lustig's theory of, of character sheaves is an, incredible, is an incredibly powerful tool. But often there's an issue in the fact that they're not directly related or like functions that you get from character sheaves are not directly related to representations. And there's, there's always a, an issue in trying to connect uh, geometrically obtained functions to uh, 
things like irreducible characters or characters of representations. So this plays kind of an intermediary role where you're just getting information about irreducible characters from actual representations as opposed to uh, uh, as opposed to uh, trying to use uh, directly geometric techniques. But of course, in the proof of this, we use uh, very uh, strong uh, geometric uh, results. So, I mean, really the kind of uh, important thing we prove is that um, the kind of non-abelian Fourier transform of these Kawanaka characters, I mean, what would, ex what would one expect this to be? So you would hope that it's, uh, you would hope that it's um, essentially the characteristic function of a character sheaf. And that's basically what we prove. We prove that it's uh, is up to scalar, the Alvis Curtis dual. of uh, a characteristic function of a character sheaf. <clears throat> okay, so one can consider this as kind of getting some uh, new information or some new interpretation of the parameterization for unipotent characters. So uh, I'll just briefly mention now the, and actually explain why this is relevant to the title of my talk. So <clears throat> let's just look at applications to modular representation theory. So let's kind of recall that uh, L is different from P. <clears throat> so I'm going to think about this uh, just at the, I'm going to think about the decomposition matrix just at the level of characters. So, so if you if you have a, an irreducible character, then you can look at the restriction of your character to the the L regular uh, conjugacy classes uh, of G. Okay, so these should be uh, of order co-prime to L. And whenever you have a function like this, this can actually be decomposed as a linear combination of the irreducible brow characters of G. So these irreducible brow characters you should think of, so these are uh, 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 characteristic zero lifts of uh, uh, simple uh, modules in uh, characteristic L. Okay, so this, uh, this by writing it like this, what am I doing? I'm taking, uh, I'm taking a, an irreducible representation in characteristic zero. I'm say over, let's say we were over QL, I'm gonna write it, I realize it as a ZL lattice and then I'm going to reduce to get something in modular uh, in with in FL. Okay, I need to take in general the fields bigger to be able to do this, but this is uh, characterizing at the level of characters this process. <clears throat> and so the uh, so the reason why we were looking at this conjecture of Kawanaka, or one reason was because we wanted to get some information or some approximation for 
for these decomposition numbers. And so this was what we were able to do using this uh, previous result. So let's assume L is not too small. And I'm going to fix a, a total order of the unipotent characters such that if I have O chi star lying beneath O xi star, then chi should be less than xi. Then there exists a total order of what I'm going to call the unipotent Brouwer characters. So these are the simple modules that occur, or the irreducible Brouwer characters that occur in the modular reduction of some uh, of some uh, unipotent character and characteristic zero. And what we were able to show is that this matrix, the decomposition matrix, has a lower unitriangular shape. So what this is really giving us is a first approximation to what uh, the theory of unipotent characters looks like in the modular setting. Okay, so it's giving some kind of, it's saying that we can uh, get some good approximation to those, uh, to those uh, characters or those representations just by looking at the, uh, at the characteristic zero, um, at the, from the characteristic zero world. <clears throat> and so why, how are these, let me just mention briefly why these two theorems are related. The, the characters that we cooked up in the previous theorem, we're, we were able to uh, we were able to arrange so that they were always projective characters, uh, because the way they're constructed is they're induced from an L prime subgroup, and so we know that they'll always be uh, be characters of projective representations. And once you know that this is once you have this uh, property about multiplicities inside projective representations. It's, uh, it's very straightforward to deduce that you have uh, this corresponding property on, on the decomposition matrix just from uh, Brouwer reciprocity. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, let's thank Jay. Um, are there any questions? So you are something on the L uh, it is to make sure that the the order, I mean, the, 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 the A is uh, the N prime or something? Yeah, I mean, we, we need to make sure, I mean, the assumption on L is, the assumption on L is not, the assumption on L, for instance, is necessary because you wouldn't know, for instance, if like, if you're in SLN and L divides N, then, it can happen that the it, well, it does happen that the unipotent characters don't form a basic set. Uh, for so there's there's no way that you can you you can't you can't uh, get a basic set just from unipotent characters. So you have to replace unipotent characters by um, uh, by other characters. So the unitriangularity property, for instance, in SLN holds when L divides N. But you have to change what you're putting here on the on the left hand side. So, what one expects in general, if you assume P is good, uh, the unitriangularity property, I think, should hold reasonably generally for 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 more general L's. It's just you have to change what you're putting here to get the right uh, to get a, the right uh, basic set. 
Okay. Does that so, answer your question? Oh yeah, can I can I ask a question? Hello? Of course, George, you can ask a question. So so one question is uh, I, I had some recent paper where I, I, I parameterized the report and representations by a pair of subgroups of A bar. And uh, I wonder, I, I have the impression that that should also can probably can be used to get something similar. So in. Is this related to, I mean, Summers has this interpretation of A bar, this group theoretic interpretation of A bar in terms of uh, conjugacy classes, no? Is this no, no, kind no, of related? No, no. No, no, no. This is something which which is maybe uh, maybe one, two weeks ago I put an archive, so it's very ah, no, not, not, maybe I'm, maybe I embarrassingly missed this. So it's a pair of subgroups. So that, that's that's very uh, so so there's a one compound uh, some pair of subgroups one one contained in the other and normal in the other. So there's a so I, I imagine that you can you can use that also to get some maybe an alternative to. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we had a real difficulty. I mean, there's a real, somehow one of the real technical issues that we faced was trying to work with the subgroup of the centralizer of U versus dealing with the quotient A bar. I mean, somehow it's, you have to, we took a, a, bit of, a bit of work to really show that you can find elements for instance, in orthogonal groups, you, you like you you have issues with trying to split. Like this, the the centralizer is not a split extension from its connected component in general, and you have to kind of try and find elements that do that do what you want, like these semi simple elements, and it's it's a bit it's a bit tricky. Okay. okay. But, uh, uh, so I have another thing. Uh, I, I just because it uh, terminology. So this is called M of A bar. We call it Dreamfeld doubles, but I don't know why you call it Dreamfeld doubles. Because I think so he should have considered this, but I think I introduced that about ten years earlier. So. Ah, okay. Well, I, uh, yeah, I think I'd, uh, I've seen it several places written Dreamfeld doubles. So, but I. No, no it, it is it is true that he he, he defined something, which is Dreamfeld double, which which but which uh, uh, but this it was not not a new it was something to already already defined no, okay, long, okay. long time before. Okay, this is good to know. Thank you. <clears throat> Can Are I here. ask a question? So do you, do you uh, know, maybe is that something older? I don't know. If when you do uh, an RTG, uh, I mean, do you have compatibility with, uh, with uh, RLGs or RTGs? So there's one specific case, for example, where you would expect that. Uh, that's uh, uh, say if you take an R that uh, doesn't divide the order of the Val group and that picks up a, 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 a D, R divides a D cyclotomic polynomial in Q, then uh, uh, you would uh, uh, expect that doing RLG from uh, the centralizer of a phi D uh, silo or something like that would. Uh, um, would send a, a simple representation of the Levy to a simple presentation of a, a plus or minus a simple module for a class of simple module for the group uh, up to lower terms, you see? So is that something that uh, uh, you, you, you can prove, you think, or, or is it easy? Or is it, I mean, is it, does it follow from things already known on irreducible characters maybe? Wait, so you're in the setting? So think, think of the Coxeter, maybe it's a Coxeter case or a Coxeter for GLN. Uh, you, you, you can uh, do, uh, take the Coxeter chorus and do RTG of, uh, uh, um, of, uh, of your one dimensional character. And then you take, uh, so you have to bring for you have to bring the action of the Hecker algebra, I should have said that. It's RTG, you take one and you do, and depending on the Frobenius eigenvalues, uh, you have an order, say an order on the Frobenius eigenvalues, which is compatible with your order on um, on, uh, on on simple modules. So I'm sorry, I, you need to, I mean, the Hecker algebra is really, it's, it's not about the tor characters of the torus or well, it's about the uh, okay. Hecker algebra. So maybe I can, maybe I can say some things that will be helpful in this direction. We, we don't claim to 
any compatibility between our labeling of the unipotent characters and Lustig's labeling of the unipotent characters. So okay, we so don't that... prove that those two okay. things coincide. Okay. Having okay. said that, I think it's not actually that hard to prove that they're the same because you know enough in the unipotent setting. I mean, somehow what we basically did was we constructed a character and then we proved that it had norm at most one, which gave us the mm -hmm. desired property, which somehow kind of circumvented having to do a lot of detailed calculations, but actually you know enough, I think, in the unipotent case. So you could actually just do these calculations and check that it's really the thing that you think it should be. Um, but I mean, this is something that certainly needs to be considered in the future. And then, I mean, as far as RLG, I mean, I don't know to what extent, I mean, you, your results with uh, with Bon FA, I mean, give you essentially that the decomposition matrix is preserved under. Uh, no, no, I mean, I really mean the case of, uh, of I really mean unipotent, I really mean uh, you do RLG of one and you would look uh, at okay. some action of a, uh, of a okay, relative okay. Hecker algebra. Okay, yeah. that's for no, you parameterize that. It's more like a the uh, Harish okay. Chandra theory a la Lustig, Howlett, Lever, uh, yeah, yeah, Boehme, sure. no. okay. Yeah, yeah, no, sure. I know, uh, I know what you're trying to ask now. And the answer is no, I don't know. But I don't think it's too, it should be possible to do that. But I, we didn't do it. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Um, if there's no more questions, let's then check. Can I ask you one more question? Oh yeah, sure, please. Go ahead. Oh, uh, what about the, uh, in the case of type BN or something, and then you have the action of the, um, the outer automorphism, which uh, flips the unipotent characters, some pairs of unipotent characters, then do you expect that, that you can choose the two total orders to be equivalent under that action? No, I mean, in this setting, I mean, really what happens, so in this, in this case, you actually, it's enough to just, these characters are separated exactly by the Gelfand Grave character. You don't actually have to take any refinement of the Gelfand Grave characters to parameterize those, uh, those ones. And you see the swapping exactly, they're, they're parameterized, they occur in uh, Gelfand Grave characters labeled by degenerate conjugacy classes. So you really see it that like the two unipotent characters are swapped and you see exactly it matches exactly the swapping on the conjugacy classes. So I guess there, yeah, so I guess yes, the answer is yes, you can, it's equivariant with respect to that, okay, uh, great. with respect to that action. Yeah, thank you. Other questions for Jay? Yeah, if there's um, no more questions, let's thank Jay for the talk. And um, we will resume in half an hour. Jay, what's the, what was the kind of, um, is it possible to say what the kind of real idea was to getting this result? Well, what do you mean? <laughs> like what the... Like it's something that people tried to do, I guess, for 20 years or so. Um, I mean, it was really this, I mean, I, I would say it's really this issue in the, the thing we the thing we spent the most time on was really trying to understand how you should lift um uh yes olivier is also pointing out that so there was definitely uh, yes this is very true there is a paper of 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 george that um parameterizes he, he parameterizes the unipotent character sheaves in terms of their uh, restrictions to conjugacy classes. And this was massively helpful. So you, uh, you, 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 in fact, that was probably the basically, apart from all the technicalities aside, the major idea was actually that you could do this because in some sense, what you have to do is 
you need something which gets you closer to the conjugacy classes. And that was kind of what George's paper does is it, it says um, you can actually, uh, you can take a, the character sheaves, restrict them to, uh, to, mixed, uh, to mixed classes, and you can separate out based on, um, on their restrictions to mixed conjugacy classes. So you fix like a unipotent class, and now you, you look at lots of mixed classes with that unipotent class as its unipotent part. Mm -hmm. And now you kind of restrict the unipotent character sheaves to all these different mixed classes. And the unipotent, he proves that the unipotent character sheaves are separated out by, uh, by, by those restrictions. Which is sort of not known before because there's some funny things that can happen which is also what George was pointing out to me in my talk, which I uh, was trying to circumvent, which is if you take a character, <laughs> so a character sheaf has a unipotent support, but it, it can be the case that you can restrict a character sheaf to its unipotent support and it becomes zero. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't happen for characters, but it does happen for character sheaves. And so you, in some sense, to do character sheaves, you really need to consider all these uh, these different uh, these different mixed classes. It's 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 really it's really important for the uh, for the classification. We got a young audience. Whoa. <laughs> But no, it was, I guess that was, no, that was probably the best. I mean, that's probably the key insight, I think, that that made it that made it work. And how do you get from character sheaves to Kawanaka characters? Uh, well, I mean, at this point you have like, I mean, this is sort of the point. So you, so the first thing you do is you like, you have these Kawanaka characters and then you define their. So the thing about the Kawanaka characters is that the values, if you try and look at their character values, it's a, it's a bit ugly. But if you take the Fourier transform, uh, if you take Lustig's non-abelian Fourier transform of these Kawanaka characters, then actually the character values become super nice, which is if, if you know it's the, the if you know it's coming from a characteristic function of a character sheaf, then you would definitely expect this. But uh, so I think actually already maybe even Kawanaka had suggested, like in his papers, he talks about maybe do, doing this uh, non-abelian Fourier transform. Um, and so now you you basically have something where you have you have a character formula for this Fourier transform and you have the characteristic function of this character sheaf, which you can basically understand the values of now because Lustig's told you where it's gonna be non-zero. So it's this classic trick of like, do to when you take Alvis Coder's duality, like what happens is that one, one thing, one function has a ton of zeros and the other function has a ton of zeros and the Alvis Coder's duality kind of flips it around. And so when you put the two things together, you get kind of like almost no like lots of stuff becomes zero and then you're just left with a tiny bit. And so you can actually like calculate these inner products between these, uh, between these two things. But Olivia is probably better at explaining this than, the, than I am. But <laughs> uh, I would say, I mean, that's kind of, yeah, I mean, this already might not, I mean, it's, it's really already occurs like in the case of type A, this, this idea already occurs in like, uh, uh, like Meinolf already uses this in type A to uh, this kind of this kind of trick where you want to you want to evaluate and in a product and you have two functions which are essentially like kind of diametrically opposed in when they're in, in where they're zero so you're just using this this same this same idea But yeah, I mean, I guess it's not. Uh, it's kind of like a good answer, but I don't know. Maybe in some sense, it's not. Uh, not 
super satisfactory. Maybe it could be more satisfactory. Like, but it, it just seems uh, tricky somehow. Like, Jay, can I have first? another question? Jay? Yes, dear. Yeah, yeah, you can ask a question, dear. Yeah, so, so in your theorem, you assume that your G is a join. Uh, well, uh, and you say that uh, because the user characters, they are insensitive to the center, but that's not, I mean, uh, so the point is, when you look at the brow characters, then maybe we have some splitting there. Yeah, so I don't assume that in the second theorem. Um, in your second theorem, you... I don't assume uh, G is a joint in the in the second theorem, just ah, okay, in the first okay. one. Okay, great, great, it's, okay, yeah. It's just, and, and you can kind of reduce to this. Um, I, I, I don't think that that's easy to do it because that's what the, the issue that the uh, no, no, it, has to deal with. with, with no, no, but it, 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 yeah, but it is because I, I mean, when I said that L is not too small, I exactly, made that assumption so I didn't have to deal with the case that you and Klesch have dealt with in SLN. Okay, okay, so- I exactly okay, so avoided it's... that situation. Because- I see, it, I see, I, I see. Like some other, the point is that we assume that, we always assume that the unipotent characters form a basic set. And so this splitting, this splitting that we control the fact that this splitting doesn't happen in, in the, by making this assumption on L. So I, I, we want something like L doesn't divide the order of the F co-invariance of the center. That's that's kind of the, the the right statement. And if you make this statement, then you can do reductions without worrying about the splitting. Okay. Okay. Then uh, then I agree. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, it's interesting already. Like our result doesn't. Like I already think it's interesting just to do all type A groups like somehow our result doesn't, you know, trying to get this re restriction, trying to remove this restriction from L for all type A groups would be, would be a good thing to do, I think. Yeah, because for type A, then for those bad crime, then we really need to, to bring in the, uh, the non universal characters. So that's, yeah, so that's exactly. what what, uh, what Sasha and I did, and and yeah, we really need some other characters to to make sure that we have the unit triangular shape. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the, this um so David uh, has this extension of of your result to SLN and SUN. Yeah. Um, and somehow the problem, like I thought a bit about trying to do it for other type A groups, and and somehow the problem is that it's it's now not just when you go from GLN to SLN, it's only the, uni the it's only the unipotent classes that are splitting. But now, you know, when you do this for other type A groups, you're going to get other mixed classes splitting as well. Uh, it, it seems it doesn't seem so straightforward to try and like uh, patch things together. I mean, I think something like what David did should work, but it's it's uh, it, it's definitely a bit more challenging in the other type A groups. So maybe maybe one thing uh, uh, is that I mean this, this I mean this what you've done solves basically I mean the fundamental starting problem for finite groups of Lie type, which is to parameterize a, a simple representations and essentially I mean essentially it's unipotent case. Okay? So that's and the way to parameterize it in some sense is by uh, saying uh, where well, there is a compatibility with characteristic zero, so we are going to use a, a characteristic zero stuff to parameterize them. So that's uh, yeah, it's amazing. That's what people try to do. But these things, with uh, when things start getting a little bit fishy, somehow that's because uh, at the end we want a parameter. It's like in the Langlands case. I mean, you have, you have a modular Langlands. So you don't parameterize by characters by the same things. I mean, it's a different uh, um, time of uh, type of know, Galois representation. So so it's similar here. At the end, you would want to. Eventually, I mean, we formulate things more like in uh, uh, using character correspondences or whatever, or voice conjecture style. You, you would use other combinatorial objects than the unipotent, some things that have really to do with L and compatible with blocks. And in such a parameterization, you shouldn't have any more problems with uh, 
who is uh, uh, having to deal with this case where unipotent is not enough or um, so there should be a completely different parameterization. Uh, I mean, conjecturally, I think we know what it is, uh, probably, except maybe for small L, which have to do with, has to do more with the L local structure, thing like that, and where things will be uh, uh, more uniform. So that's I mean, I, I guess you should be replacing, I mean, these irreducible characters of this A group that come up, I mean, should be, I mean, when L is dividing the order of A, it, it should be something like you replace it with projectives, right? Like, I think this is like Olivier, Olivier has a, had a student who looked at this kind of question. And I think there he, he looked exactly at this thing where you should. Um, I'm thinking of trying to do some sort of whatever it means, some sort of maybe of more of a Langlands dual description or something like that, you see, I mean, it, but you're right. I mean, somehow the question is, one should try to think from a maybe more geometric long lens point of view, what's happening, uh, um, yeah, what's happening with, uh, with uh, I don't know, uh, what one would do in the function field case, maybe with model coefficients with uh, mod L, yeah. This shift supported on uh, unipotent classes when, uh, um, yeah, when L divides the characteristics of group. I mean, what's happening in the long lens dual description. So that would be maybe good to, because the, 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 someone we, we're looking at the parametrization from, from uh, yeah, I th anyway, I think it should be, you, one should expect that in uh, some sort of dual world, uh, things would be smoother with respect to uh, smaller L's. Uh. So what you're talking about trying to like develop this, push this theory to get like, uh, this kind of result for like unipotent characters of disconnected groups that's that's kind of no no not no no just for <clears throat> things that from the point of view of this parameterization that you have uh, uh, for mod l representations uh, say you parameterize simple mod l's by uh, use relating to the characteristic zero simples which we know how to parameterize by lustig uh, and the parameterization by lustig in some sort of i mean as i mean it's not clear where but anyway, it's it's close to uh, maybe some kind of long long type parameterization, or I mean, it's not clear where the dual dual things dual things are exactly. But what I mean is that one should try module L uh, to have a, a, a result that somehow uh, doesn't care about uh, um, about unipotent characters or whatever that somehow express directly, maybe in terms of as you say, as classes and uh, and these small groups, the poetry, whatever. I mean. Yeah, that's what I mean. But I mean, we want to we want to forget about the characteristic zero uh, uh, important characters and the, and do everything in a in a way that where even if L is a two for classical groups, the uh, uh, so description still works. I mean, if you think of uh, of uh, your group being as a general finite groups and hoping that there is some kind of uh, um, version of Boris conjecture or something from Abelian defect, I mean, some way to parameterize, which we would hope for LITAP is, uh, is natural, and then you, something should work for, even for small, the so smallest pairs, there should be something, some uniform way of parameterizing uh, all simples, uh, I believe. Uh, 